So it's no secret on this channel that I kind of really love shonen manga. It's the reason I got into making videos, half of my content is based around the demographic. I have multiple bookshelves dedicated to just Shonen Jump series specifically. Shonen anime was something I grew up with from a really young age, probably like a lot of you honestly. Watching Dragon Ball Z and Yu Yu Hakusho late at night on Toonami and Adult Swim when I was supposed to be in bed asleep because I had school the next morning but fuck that. I actually remember the very first time I saw the first episode of Yu Yu Hakusho. I was in the basement in my grandma's house watching TV at like 8 years old at 2 in the morning or something, and I saw Yusuke dive out to protect that kid from a reckless driver and me watching thinking, wait a minute, did this cartoon just say hell and ass? Because the concept of anime wasn't a thing that I knew about yet, and I just thought that this older looking cartoon was straight up cussing on a kid's channel. Laying in bed watching early episodes of Inuyasha where the endless love triangle between Kagura Gome, Inuyasha, and Kikyo legit had me in a trance at like age 10. I uh, always preferred Kikyo as a kid because she was a cold bitch and uh, I have a type. It's from these childhood memories that now today I obviously still have such a huge love of shonen series and all the basic tropes and generic problems that stretch across so many of them. But even as a kid, there was one shonen series that I would see pop up on TV called Zatch Bell. And when it did, I changed the fucking channel. <laughs> like I looked at the designs of the characters and thought, <laughs> that looks like it's for babies and tried to act really smug about hating it when I was just like 11 and stupid. Unfortunately, that dumbass baby brain mindset kind of lasted until just a few years back when it came to Zatch Bell, before one day someone posted this panel specifically on Twitter and I quickly realized two things. One, Zatch Bell was based on a manga I had no clue that even existed. And two, holy shit it looks raw! Now admittedly by this point, I want to say 2018-ish, I had grown a lot in my taste and I've learned to find value in legit like most things even if they're trash. I made a whole fucking video on prison school, I mean come on, what can you say? So I was already much more open to the idea of reading Zatch Bell in general. But after this page, this one in particular, I knew I had to read it at some point soon. And then like smash cut to 2022 where I read it all in one single week on a beach in Florida, and now a year later I'm making a video about it. And after finishing it on that beach in Florida, I gotta say, it's a shame I avoided the series for so long because completely unknown to me, Zatch Bell was actually a legitimate peak of the entire shonen demographic a thing I already had such a massive love for, and it just continued to blow me away in ways that I didn't expect based on those few memories of the show in my head that were skewed by dumb kid brain. So today, let's talk about this series and what makes it so worthy of a legendary status in my eyes, the one and only Zatch Bell. Except, from this point on, I'll be calling it by both Zatch Bell and more so by its original Japanese name, Gash Bell, and mostly referring to all names by their Japanese versions because it's, it, it's just what I read online, like it's the only English version that technically exists not counting really old Viz prints, prints that we'll talk more about here in just a bit. The full title of the manga in Japan is Konjiki no Gash, with Zatch's name actually being Gash, the translations for America's release being the reason for the name swap. Now, the most official reasoning I can find as to the change in general is just that Gash isn't an appealing word to a western audience like it's the type of word you usually associate when you fall down and scrape your leg on some concrete or something, while in their eyes, Zatch felt snappy and cool, to which I kinda agree with, I think Zatch works super well as his name honestly, it's fitting in an odd way. And there's also the rumor that the name was changed from Gash due to the word being a slang term in the UK for, uh, big pussy. No clues if that's legit or not, that's just an internet rumor, but considering how many early Viz translations were very obviously English UK British boy translations, I wouldn't fucking doubt it honestly. 
I know those name changes might be odd for some that grew up with certain names from the dubbed anime in older volumes, so sorry about that, it is what it is. Also, this is kind of a first for the channel, but unfortunately, the scans for Gash Bell that I'll be using are, well, what they are. Bit of a history lesson before we dive in, but for those who don't know, Gash Bell ran in Weekly Shonen Sunday from January of 2001 all the way until December 26 of 2007. Wow lasting 33 total volumes. After its ending in Japan, the author and artist Makoto Kawada, who goes by the pen name Makoto Raiku, that's how most of us know him, requested a lot of his original drawings and artworks from Gash be returned to him from Shogakukan, which by all accounts is a common practice for an artist once a series is finished, like this isn't exactly a rare thing to ask. Shogakukan sent them back, but was noticeably missing a few of his personally colored artworks. These are the ones right here, actually. Claiming that they just flat out lost them. Raiku, upset that his art was treated with that much disregard, hit his lawyers up, went to court, and demanded over 3 million yen in compensation, so around 25,000 USD. To which Shogaku Khan only offered 500,000 yen as a return, so basically like 4,000 USD, a sign that Raiku took his disrespectful. To him, this lawsuit was more about the higher-ups giving proper respect to the artists and their work, and to not look down on them is just basic worker bees making a product to consume in disregard, trying to address this awful mindset the editors had of, well who cares if we lose some art, we can just pay the manuscript fees and have them redraw it, like that's a suitable solution to losing original artwork. When it comes to all these factors, hell yeah dude, Raiku is totally right. People forget, or just don't care to begin with, that manga and anime are art being created from real people, and those people have value and deserve respect for their work. As the case went on, tons of info came out about his relationships between him and his editors, assistants, the fucking accounting department at Shogakukan. Like, it was a whole mess and Raiku was not thrilled about any of it. So in his own way, this lawsuit was about taking the struggles of his fellow artists who had all suffered through the years and demanded change from their bosses. Over time, the case itself was settled with generic boring legal shit and Raikou was awarded a payout. But notably, Raikou gained all of the rights to Gash Bell as a property and announced he would no longer be working with Shogaku Khan ever again, ending their print run of the manga in Japan and cancelling the English Viz release mid-story, ending here in the US at volume 25 out of 33. Which is exactly why those prices stay so high on resale volumes, what no reprints after that ever again. He also had a small stint with Kodansha a few years later on his series Animal Lands for 14 total volumes, which was fairly successful and I need to read it myself personally, following that up with another manga titled Vector Ball. But that one he ended early due to disagreements with Kodansha's editors and an overall fallout with the company. So, with all of these separate publisher issues over the years, Bro said fuck it, I'll do it myself, and as of now, he is still the sole owner of Gash Bell as a property, releasing any new content for it under his own personal studio's name, Bergden Board. So that's why you can't find the manga in English anymore, and why any official digital release of it in the West never happened. Meaning the scans I mentioned earlier are older and a bit low quality at times, despite them actually getting much better as the series goes on. Around volume 18, they're more than fine. It's really unfortunate that the only way to currently read the series is not in an official way, but I understand and support the fuck out of his position. He's totally correct. No affiliate link type shit or anything, but I've got some links below to Amazon where you can buy Japanese copies officially, so if you want to support it, that's a good way to do it. And a specific shout out to Harley over at Rumic World for recently compiling all this together for ease of access and understanding, like that was super helpful. Got a link below if you want the full court details, it's got all the shits. Anyway, all that real world bullshit aside, let's actually talk about the fucking manga now! Set in an unassuming Japanese town, the story follows Kiyomaro Takamine, a fairly basic 14-year-old middle school student. He initially comes off as a bit antagonistic and reclusive, others at school talking loudly about their jealousy and distaste of him because he's so damn smart, and in turn making him into a bit of an asshole to most people. He considers them lower than he is, bored with things like school because they're just pointless at his level of big genius. 
Then one morning as he's just sitting in his room half dazed out and arguing about that same pointlessness of going to class with his mom, a big ass bird crashes through his window carrying a naked boy with tiny horns named Gash. This kid holding both a letter from Kiyomaro's father, who is some professor at a university overseas, and a red book full of strange symbols that no one can seem to understand. And this letter isn't much help at understanding what the fuck just happened either. His father just saying in the note, Hey, uh, I found this kid in the woods. He has no memory and I don't fucking know what this book says. You're my son and you're pretty smart, but I hear you've been a lame ass lately and that's no good. So uh, look after this kid for me and be a better person, yeah? Leaving Kiyomaro to take care of this naked boy. Gash, the opposite of Kiyomaro, is bold, loud, and extremely honest. A literal electric ball of energy and positivity who just legit always makes me smile. And despite having no memory of anything before waking up in the forest with Kiyo's dad, he decides from frame one that it's his personal goal to help Kiyomaro both grow as a person since he was becoming kind of an asshole, but also just to help him find friends and make meaningful connections since Kiyo would fallen so far into a pit of self-apathy. And as Kiyomaro studies the red book that was brought with Gash, he learns that he can read certain parts of the book. And over time, more lines are somehow becoming readable to him, despite the language still being totally unknown. The first word he understands being Zakaru, which when shouted out and combined with the willpower and heart of both Kyo and Gash together, the red book emitting a bright flash of light, it causes an extremely powerful burst of electricity to fly from Gash's mouth. Them actually using it the first time to protect one of Kyo's old friends from someone who was being an asshole and talking mad shit about Kiyomaru. Something Gash absolutely would not fucking stand for because you ain't about to dump on his friends in front of him. That ain't, that ain't happening. And from here, despite not knowing what the hell just happened with that big electric blast, Kyo can't help but be fond of the little dude who just refused to hear any shit talk about him. The two starting to become fast friends and both beginning to learn about Gash, the Red Book, and the upcoming battles where they will have no choice but to fight for their survival. This first chapter, both on my initial read and my reread for this video, just blew my ass away with how absolutely perfect it is. Establishing right away a solid goal for the characters, both learning about Gash, the Red Book, and his missing memories, as well as showing off both how absolutely hilarious the characters and art can be, but also how fucking raw it can hard shift when Raikou wants it to. Originally wanting to draw a story about a cowardly kid who finds an old toy that grows into a big knight and they use it to fight evil, the character of Gash was created by Raikou for that toy idea. He was wanting to do a series that was mainly focused on the heartwarming nature of good friendships, so he took that design of Gash to create the dynamic that would form Kiyomaro and Gash, one serious and smart and the other full of heart and passion. After forming this dynamic in the initial questions of the Red Book, the true plot of the manga comes into focus as the duo is attacked over and over by these strange kids and their human counterparts. Kyo using this ever-changing Red Book to blast new spells out of Gash and defend themselves, before finally Brago and Sherry, who are basically just Sasuke and Sasuke's cool friend, lay the rules of the plot down on the table for the duo while exerting their presence. Every 1,000 years, 100 demon children called Mamudo come from the demon world into ours with their own personal spell books to find a human partner. After finding that partner, a vicious battle begins between all 100 of the Mamudo, with the last one standing becoming the new king of the demon world the ruler of the entire underworld for the next 1,000 years. This begins the series-long war that stretches between almost every character Kyo and Gash come across, each Mamudo and their human partner fighting for their own goals, having their own personal reasons for wanting to win and becoming a king for the new millennium. And using this battle as the background for the entire series, Raikou is able to create one of the most satisfying manga I've ever read in all types of different ways. But the first example I'm going to talk about is the one that got me totally off guard and was the reason I even showed up here in the first place. That being, it's art. 
The Art and Gash Bell was something that, like I had said, completely blew me out the fucking water. Battle scenes are drawn with an intensity that really generates the growing pressure and power in the panels. The extremely heavy black lines and hyper dark shading used non-stop to show the force a character's actions are giving off, even if it's just dialogue with no actual combat. Raikou is just masterful through the series in expressing whatever emotion he wants his characters to convey so clearly to the reader. The actions and reactions always heighten to the highest degree in forcing you into how the person on page is feeling. At the core, it's a shonen power battle series, so a lot of attacks are the big bang power type moves, be it shooting electricity from your mouth, creating giant floating shields, total gravity control, general strength buffs and power ups, all being revealed as duos learn new spells in their books over time. So basically, there's just non-stop full spreads of spells causing absolute devastation. The scale and intensity only growing bigger as the surviving Mamuda would logically be the stronger fighters. Raikou is a king of the full page spread, and whether it's just a Zakaru blast against another demon or a massive sized standoff between dragon and monster off the coast of Japan, the series is literally dripping with them through the entire run and it makes so many of the fights memorable for just how fucking raw they are. Even if the battle in the grand scale of things was kind of small. It's an action series, so there's tons of pages that are just general back and forths, attacking slash reacting with general commentary from bystanders, you know, the usual shonen shit. But the encounters themselves never feel lazy or hard to understand. Their movement and intention is always clear and directly to the point, and honestly, almost always extremely badass in some way. But, for all of the amazing emotional battle shots and dope shit I've just shown and talked about, there's another aspect to the art and combat that's just as important, if not even more so sometimes, that's a huge part of the series from the very start. Of course, that being the fact that Raikou is able to create the most absolute lovable scrimblo chungus cast of characters I have ever seen. I mentioned back at the start that I thought the series was for babies growing up, and it is 1000% due to the character designs I saw, admittedly mostly coming from Gash and Kyan Shomei, but little did my dumbass baby brain know that at the time, these two were pretty fucking tame compared to what the rest of the series was cooking. The entire cast of demons are all drawn with absolute disregard to any traditional design sense, and just range all over the place in what the fuck they could even be. Like Umagon is just a horse, with also an evil horse existing. This one is a weird frog person from Chrono Trigger. This dude is a star? This one is just a robot and I, I don't even know what the fuck this is. But like, Raikou is able to keep it so fresh when introducing his new characters for this exact reason, because you you could never guess what kind of goof-ass design they're gonna have, or even more, what kind of ridiculous personality they're gonna back it up with. Everyone has this one specific face for when they're either being a dipshit or dealing with dipshits, and it never fucking got old to me because of how smart it was used whenever the series comedy is the focus. Which is more than you'd expect honestly, like the humor is mixed in so well with the art and battles, that it becomes just as strong as a part of the series as anything else. Without a doubt, I can't think of another manga that walks such a fine balancing act between, okay yeah, this design is just too goofy, and then you see a panel of them in action drawn with the full series artistic design behind it, and it's like, oh shit, wait, this slaps actually. Having this awesome juxtaposition between their out of combat and in battle art, and it helps create this sense of tension in the fights when the goofiness stops and shit becomes real. It quickly slapping you in the face and making you remember, hey, this is still a war, goddammit, and despite it being a goofy ass shonen series, the Mamudo still have to win or lose, and these fights are all full of anger, desperate emotions, and tearful goodbyes. Regardless of anything I've said so far about how silly the series can be, when it comes to the demon tournament and the overall plot, it's so refreshing to see just how seriously it really does take itself.
I've mentioned that the war between Mamudo was to decide the future ruler of the demon world. With this being the stage for the battles, each of the 100 demon children must fight the others using their spell books, the losing demon being the one whose book is burnt to a crisp, showing their loss. The Mamudo sometimes choosing to ignore combat completely and just go straight for the book, ending the rival demon's fight instantly and sending them home. The spell books themselves are actually based on the Red Book of Appen, the Devil Stolen Grimoire as it's called, an occult-ass spell book from the 1400s that's said to have been a personal item of Vlad the Impaler, but that's a little contested, meh. It's got runes and spells and shit in it, it looks pretty dank honestly, you can find info online, here's a video, check it out. When I was a kid and still dumb about the series, I did see the Red Book in commercials and think, damn, that looks kind of cool actually, and I always wanted one, which now because the the future is anime, you could buy one that costs a sick dick amount of cash and it lights up and has noises and everything. Like, Kid Me would be obsessing over that despite not knowing shit about the anime. Anyway, after a demon loses, his spellbook is burnt almost seemingly by force as nothing anyone does can ever extinguish the flame once it's begun. And as the book turns to ash, the demon child fades away as well, returning to their world having lost the battle. It's not until after his first few fights where Gash realizes this fact that the losers are forcibly being sent back home, and it clicks that he would be separated from Kiyomaru if he lost, and that he himself actually doesn't remember anything about his home to begin with. This massive demon under world where they're being returned to after a loss. Surviving his first few battles and now understanding the actual stakes of both losing and winning, Gash makes a series-long decision that whoever would cause a battle that creates so much suffering and sadness between these kids and their human friends they've all begun to meet is honestly a fucking shitty king. So he's gonna be the one who wins this battle to become the kind king of the demon world, ruling over it all with actual compassion. And as crazy as it sounds, that's it! That's the 300 plus chapter plot of Gash Bell that begins at volume 2. 100 demons in all, last one standing wins, fucking go! Of course there are small and large arcs that make up this battle, specific evil demons to fight, and the mysterious kid in the shadows who looks exactly like Gash and uses lightning powers too. But no matter what twists and turns it takes, it never strays from being exactly what it said in volume 1, a battle to be king, a battle where both friends and enemies lose constantly, them being stricken away from the human world and the story itself. And that exact plot point is where I think Gash Bell is really able to carve out its own unique shonen path and stand so high above others. Oh, and uh, visual spoilers I guess past here, no major plot talk but gotta show a couple of things. Death in shonen manga is always treated oddly. It feels like when a major character in most shonen die, there's always that immediate thought of, I, how are they gonna walk this one back? And usually it's not incorrect, some big ones excluded of course. Now at the end of the day, these are stories made for kids that are in a literal children's magazine. I'm defo not saying these characters have to die for the story to be good, but when a character in a shonen manga actually does finally take a real hit and dies, passing out of the pages of the series they've been in for so long, it leaves a lasting impression. It's gotta be challenging for an author to make the choice to remove a character with finality in a way that feels satisfying to both them as a creator and us as readers. And in Gash Bell, where defeat doesn't exactly mean death, but more of an erasure from the world, it finds a perfect balance between the two extremes. If one of the demon kid loses their battles in Gash Bell, they aren't just beaten and then left on the ground to sleep with the plot moving on, nor are they killed over and over for these battles between all 100 demons. They're instead just completely wiped away. They aren't dead, but they were beaten in a way that literally erases them from the story with zero chance of returning. And for that exact reason, the fake fear of death some series give off is just completely gone. And instead, there's actual tension there because if they lose, they won't die. They just get kicked the fuck out of the plot, which helps subvert the need to outright kill a character in a kid's manga, but still making the stakes very real. And honestly, this is what I do think makes Gash Bell able to stand as a peak of shonen storytelling. Raikou found a way to dance around the limitation of death in the fights while still making every one of them matter individually. 
this isn't a war of second chances, and despite it being an outright shonen ass kids manga, Raikou almost never pulls the harder punches and treats his series with a level of respect that's so refreshing as a reader. Mixing this factor in with each battle, combined with a stellar art in both combat and when the characters are just goofing off and having fun together, it creates the perfect balance that is Gash Bell. An extremely fun shonen series that is 100% fucking serious about its plot and characters, treating them with both proper respectful development and general comedic dipshitness, lasting for over 300 chapters and creating one more thing that I really want to talk about. That being, the absolute perfect pacing the story manages to pull off over its 33 total volumes. A super consistent issue that stretches across tons of different series, both shonen or otherwise, is being able to keep up a steady sense of growth and progression over the entire course of the plot, to be able to start a story and follow to its ending without ever feeling like it spent too much time in this arc, or not enough time was given to a certain conclusion or big reveal, things moving at a slower than snail's pace or at the A-train speed of sound, leaving you just sitting there reading like, I I'd I guess. Even even in some of my most favorite series of all time, there's moments where I'm both like, alright, let's wrap it up gang, or damn, that's really all you're gonna give me, huh? But when it comes to Gash, it's one of the most steady, beat by beat building blocks all coming together to make a story that feels like it's never wasting time experiences that I've ever had. From Kyo learning about the first spell with Gash, meeting Sherry and Brago and learning about the Mamudo War. Each of the battles the duo faces from then on slowly growing in scale as they meet allies and enemies, Gash's new and powerful spells revealing themselves in the Red Book and always being useful or different in function. Kiyomaro's resolve and just general humanity growing stronger as him and Gash become closer, with Gash's goal of becoming a kind king always staying the thing he's fighting for, being as friendly as possible to anyone he can, choosing to make friends over burning books in the demon battle if he's able. And when that friendship doesn't work and the demon in front of him fights regardless, despite his extremely childlike and kind nature, Lil Dude goes buck wild and never holds back, instead fighting with his full heart and power. Kiyomaro always by his side giving the perfect orders and standing tall when any other human should fall, the perfect goddamn team. This increasing scale of battles mixed with the actual tension I mentioned earlier from the risk of the duo losing their book, creates this unstoppable freight train of a story that's a banger the entire ride. With the plot being structured around 100 total demons, the series had a hard time limit from early on, and despite doing a thing or two to prolong the overall battle, fights had to matter because there could only be so many between all of the characters, so as the story progressed to its conclusion and the total number number of remaining demons drop, the rising tension hits its peak naturally over time, like as soon as you start to think, damn this is fight 5, how many demons are still left out there? The spell book literally gets a windows update and says, damn we halfway there, 50 demons left, good luck, and it comes together to create such a satisfying and believable journey there. Each major arc ending with more contestants taken down and the remaining demons all being the heaviest of the hitters, the most powerful of them being the one who will reshape the demon world in their own image for 1000 years. There is a final goal other than just outright being king, you know, stakes that raise the final battle up to being way more important and adding a sense of, well goddamn boys we can't lose this one. Yeah. And while I won't spoil what it is here because it's like final four volume stuff, the way it ties into the overall theming and the battles of the series is really smart, and adds the perfect level of fear for your characters that a final arc should have. Also, unlike a lot of its shonen contemporaries, it somehow sticks its landing into being one of the absolute best and most satisfying conclusions I have ever read. I'm not talking about the final arc specifically with Clear Note, which I will say is not as strong as the Faudo arc that came before, but Clear Note looks like an 80s power metal villain from Bastard so it's still pretty raw in my book, but more so the actual last few chapters after the big bad enemy is defeated. I don't want to outright spoil it and honestly I've tried to spoil as little as possible in this video, but the last chapter is just slowing down after all the fights and reeling everything in. The journey of growth Kiyomaro and Gash had together, the friends they gained and lost in each battle that have laid the path for them to arrive where they are now. 
It reflects on this absolutely amazing and fun ride for both you, the reader, and for our two main boys, who now have to go on and face their separate futures. Kyo moving on to higher education and Gash heading home to become king. And it really, like, it feels like saying bye to an actual real ass best friend that you just don't know if you'll see again. The good times, the bad times, everything that brought you to this moment. It all just like, swells up and overflows, you know? Gash's original goal before becoming a kind king was to make Kiyomaru a better guy to help him make friends and become a little light in his world. And over the course of these 300 plus chapters, you've seen their friendship grow and deepen, them becoming unstoppable partners and the best of brothers. It's a perfect ending because in the last chapters, demon battles aside and all the shit about the war and king being dealt with, it's just best friends having to say goodbye to each other after a long ass friendship together. Something that's relatable and understandable. Really tugging on those heartstrings, honestly. Both somber and sweet, it's a perfect bow to the series. A perfect bow that as of 2022 has been scooted to the side in a toy box open back up for some more fun baby because Gash Bell 2 has begun. Yeah out of nowhere years later, Raikou is back for a full fledged self published sequel to Gash Bell set five years after the end of the first series. At the time of writing this, the amount of chapters is still pretty short, it being a monthly series now where Gash Bell 1 was weekly, but honestly, just like personally 10 chapters in and yeah, I'm completely sold dude. Absolutely love the new Gash design, cannot wait to see the rest of the cast, and you can easily tell Raikou's art has improved a lot, mixing with that monthly release schedule to give him more time on drawings which already whipped ass in Gash Bell one. Yeah, loving it so far, 10 out of 10, another banger on his hands, what can you say? It unfortunately, like the main series, has no official release, but it does have a team putting in the work online, so if you want to take a look, you can read it for yourself. And just like the original series, you can order volumes on Japanese Amazon, look up a guide on how to do it, it's real easy, like I said, links below. Support Zatch slash Gash however you can, Raikou deserves it, maybe one day we'll get some kind of an English print, who knows. One thing I know I've 100% barely talked about at all is the anime adaptation by Toei, the one that turned me away from the series as a kid. And honestly, no lies to tell, I really just didn't have time to watch all 150 episodes for this video, still already trying and failing to stay caught up on new shit and playing and reading and watching all the shit I've missed. Also I've gotten into comics pretty big lately, Marvel specifically, and it's really taking up my time, which is a whole other discussion, but if you have comic recommendations, post them below. From what I have seen for both the English 4Kids dub, which had that banger theme song that I liked even as a kid. I still remember hearing that, you know who's got the power, yeah that shit jam, peak fiction. And of course with the original Japanese version, it seems rough around the edges honestly, but very obviously has heart. Like yeah the action may fall flat at times from bad animation, it has lots of filler and an anime only ending, but you can tell the staff did care about the series to some extent, and I think it's at least worth checking out some moments for that. Shouts out Barry Mellon. Catch my head, Barry Mellon. Does have filler movies that are as fine as any weekly anime filler movie, so you can check those out if you're bored. Some really solid animation in them, honestly. And, eh. and yeah, the four kids dub itself is just a whole other mess that is. It's about the same level of quality as any other four kids dubs that weren't Yu Gi Oh, so take that as what you will. And I mean like Duel Masters Yu Gi Oh, not GX. GX's dub is a whole different fucking thing. Oh yeah, and Gash being voiced by the Japanese actor for Chopper from One Piece really made me laugh because because that is super fitting, smart casting there, gang. I know I purposely didn't dive much into the series arcs themselves and its multiple plot beats like Faudo, Balzakeruga, and Zeno, things like that, but honestly, I don't feel like I really need to because it's a series that speaks way better for itself and what it does from its week to week pages than I can give it. All I really want to do is stand from a mountaintop and scream at whoever will listen that Gash slash Zatch Bell is a peak of shonen, despite any preconceived thoughts some of us may have had about what the series was growing up. From characters to art, from serious plot to serious comedy, there's really nothing else that truly feels just like Gash. 
a manga with its own unique brand of both stupid and powerful, something that's able to take all these individual shonen elements and make them, at least in my eyes, nearly perfect. If you take away anything from this channel at all, it should be that I really like Danganronpa, Trigun is a 10 out of 10, and so is Gash Bell. Cross your fingers that one day the series will be allowed to exist officially in English again, and until then, I'm gonna ride the wave of Gash Bell 2 into the future cause it's looking really fucking good fam. See you next time.